All right. Whoa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, Thursday at QIP 2022. We're going to have some cryptographic talks this morning, and we're going to kick off uh, the session with Lua and Xian um, on beating classical impossibility of position verification. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, and thanks everyone for uh, waking up early to attend my talk. So yeah, um, this is joint work with Jia Hui, Liu, and Qi Peng Liu, and I will be talking about position verification. Um, so let me start by telling you what is a position verification. So imagine that um, you are an astronaut and there are some uh, ground mission station that wants to verify your um, position in a cryptographically secure way. So think of, uh, so for this talk, I'll use the uh, notion of provers and verifiers. So the prover, uh, uh, for example, in the example that I just talked about is an astronaut and wants to convince the verifiers of uh, the location, of his location. And the main technique for doing this is uh, what is called um, uh, distance bounding. So uh, imagine uh, the, there is a verifier. What you can do is that you are going to send a message and then uh, ha have the prover respond immediately. So if the prover, uh, so by timing uh, how much time it takes for the prover to respond to you, um, by no faster than light principle from general relativity, uh, you, you'll be uh, assured that the prover is within a certain radius of you. So in order to get a better uh, position estimate, you can just do it uh, for multiple verifiers, and then you can uh, get a better estimate by triangulating the prover. So in this case, we can we all know that the prover will be in the middle. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that this thing is uh, insecure if there are multiple adversaries that, uh, that are colluding and trying to jointly convince the verifiers of an incorrect position. So in this case, I, uh, we have prover, uh, uh, these two uh, adversaries, uh, one over there, one over there, um, and they were able to jointly convince the verifier that they are in the middle, while in reality, um, both of them are actually um, very far away from uh, the position that they claim to be. So uh, in, in fact, there is a more general impossibility. So um, think of the following uh, very generic setup uh, where uh, I, I have something like a Minkowski diagram over here. So the horizontal axis represents the X axis, so the space. And for now, just think of one dimensional space. And the vertical axis represents time. Um, so at the beginning, uh, there are uh, two verifiers, one uh, at the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. And there is a prover in the middle that wants to convince them that um, he is at this certain position. So the, the generic, uh, very generic protocol looks like following. So the verifier on the left sends a message M0, and the verifier on the right sends another message M1, so that they are supposed to reach the prover at the same time. So both of them travel at the speed of light. And, uh, and the prover, upon receiving these two messages, uh, is supposed to immediately compute a function on these messages. And then once, once he's done that, he'll um, report the outcome R to both verifiers or broadcast the um, computation outcome. And the verifiers could check that um, this is the correct thing that he is supposed to compute. So now let's try to attack this protocol. So uh, consider there are two adversaries. Both of them are uh, bounded away from uh, the correct position, and they are trying to jointly uh, collude to con convince the verifiers that uh, they are in the middle, while in reality, they are not. So uh, there is a very simple attack, which is just simply that um, the adversary at the left could just um, send the message uh, to the right while also remembering the message for himself. And similarly for the adversary on the right, he'll uh, forward the message to the left while also remembering the message for himself. So after one round of communication, they both know N0 and M1 and therefore can compute R. Um, yeah, and furthermore, uh, so here, uh, 
you can you can you can check that the timing constraint is satisfied. And furthermore, um, I only assume that f is a, a function, but you can also consider randomized functionality f. And they can also defeat uh, randomized f by simply pre-sharing the randomness to be used. And uh, furthermore, this attack is uh, very efficient. So not even having any computational assumption will help you construct a secure position verification protocol. So that's the state of art for uh, uh, classical position verification. Uh, so the impossibility that I just described is due to Chandran, Goyal, Moriarty, and Ostrovsky in 2009. And uh, following this impossibility, they constructed protocol that is secure against uh, uh, in a more restricted model. So in particular, uh, they consider bonded storage adversaries. And um, there is a long line of work uh, studying position verification in the quantum setting. It turns out that uh, if you use quantum communication, you can get around the impossibility. And um, that's, so this is the state of the art. And in, in this talk or in our work, uh, we provide a twist on this um, line of work, which is that we achieve classically verifiable position verification against quantum adversaries, uh, assuming quantum hardness of learning with errors which is the, uh, the standard cryptographic uh, assumption that, um, a lattice assumption that uh, um, it, in Sunday's tutorial, Chris talked about. Uh, so by classically verifiable, I simply means that um, the, the verifiers are completely classical. In particular, this means that they can only use classical communication. And we also show that we cannot do much better than this. Um, in particular, uh, we show that uh, if any classically verifiable position verification would give you what is known as a single prover proof of quantumness. And therefore, um, uh, uh, with some further logic, you can show that um, in order to get this kind of protocol, you have to get, uh, have a quantum prover or a prover with some quantum capabilities. And furthermore, computational assumptions are also necessary. So unlike uh, in the quantum communication case where you can get um, uh, somewhat information theoretic security here, you have to assume the computational bound and computational assumptions. Um, so uh, this is basically getting security against unentangled adversaries. So um, uh, what, we sh what we also show is that um, First of all, uh, the, the protocol that we construct uh, can, uh, ha has some, uh, only constant soundness, but you can um, amplify the soundness or security using a very natural variant of the parallel repetition of the position verification protocol that we construct. And to cast security against entangled adversaries, uh, unfortunately, you, uh, we need to assume some um, more assumptions or uh, an idealized cryptographic model. So in particular, um, if you assume LWE is sub exponentially hard, then we can get security against any bounded entanglement. And if you want unbounded entanglement, uh, we can bootstrap our protocol so that uh, it, is, it will be secure in the quantum random oracle model, which is the standard cryptographic ideal model. Um, and we also show that for the standard model constructions, uh, there is also an attack if you share a large amount of entanglement. So if you share more, uh, much more entanglement than the entanglement bound allows, then you, you will be able to efficiently attack our protocol as well. So the nice thing about all these results um, is that there are actually pretty straightforward extensions of the uh, ex pre-existing ideas in quantum position verification, um, just uh, uh, move to our uh, protocol or our context. So for the rest of the talk, um, I will talk about briefly how uh, our construction or our protocol works. But before that, I want to first motivate why uh, having classical communication is relevant or especially desirable uh, for the uh, task of position verification. And this is simply because if you think about position verification, the only uh, model of communication that makes sense is wireless communication or free space communication. Um, obviously, it doesn't make sense if you are verifying someone's uh, position using 
uh, uh, an Ethernet cable. And uh, uh, inherent property of free space communication or wireless communication is that it has a very high loss. So um, back in 2015, Qi and Seopsis have shown that um, a lot of non-quantum position verification protocols actually break down if the loss is very high. So meaning that um, you either um, will not be able to verify the honest prover's position uh, or the adversary will, will be able to attack the protocol if the highest loss enough, high enough. And there, there are um, a bunch of subsequent works trying to study the um, this topic, so they, they try to construct quantum position verification protocols that are loss tolerant, meaning that um, uh, they will tolerate a higher rate of loss. And as far as we're concerned, um, the state of the art is that uh, we can get fully loss tolerant quantum position verification protocols in the quantum setting against unentangled adversaries. Um, why, uh, for loss tolerance simply means that um, the, the position verification protocol will work no matter how high the loss is, as long as it is bounded away from one. And if you think back to classical communication position verification protocol, you can always simply um, repeat the message at no cost to the security. So uh, a, a corollary of our work is that we actually get full loss tolerance uh, against even entangled adversaries um, uh, in the standard, sorry, in the quantum random oracle model or bonded, uh, bonded security uh, in the standard model assuming sub-exponential hardness of LWE. And um, some additional advantage uh, includes the following. So, uh, uh, in practice, if you look at what people do, uh, how people do free space QKD, they actually use a tracking laser in order to keep the loss uh, to a minimum. And obviously you don't need this kind of expensive equipment if you want to do only classical communication. And furthermore, uh, classical communication is desirable because you can compose them more easily. Uh, for example, uh, for, for, the, for the purpose of position verification, uh, position-based cryptography, it is much easier to do authentication of the messages uh, or more trivial to do that. Okay, so those are the practical advantages. Now let me move on to uh, uh, the idea of how to construct this kind of um, position verification protocols. So just to start, let me remind you how um, quantum position verification protocols work. And this is uh, the, the protocol that has been uh, studied by a lot of prior work. Uh, and this protocol uses quantum communication. In particular, it has the desirable property that only one message is quantum. And so this will be a good starting point uh, if, you, if we want to um, construct classical position verification. So the protocol is the following. Um, the, uh, the prover at the middle will have a, a photon detector. And uh, the, the verifier on the left is going to send a photon um, encoding some BB84 state for, uh, so basically, basically he samples two random bit B and theta and send the BB84 state to the prover. And the verifier on the right is going to uh, also tell the prover uh, which basis the BB84 state is encoded in. So the theta in this case. Um, and the prover is supposed to immediately, upon receiving these two messages, measure the photon in the correct basis to recover the encoded bit B. And then he is supposed to report the measurement outcomes to both ends. Um, so it turns out that this, um, this protocol can be proven secure. And the reason is that if you look back at the First of all, uh, if you look at back at the impossibility, this impossibility doesn't work because here we are actually implicitly assuming that um, the adversary on the left could clone the whatever the message is being sent. And this is not true if uh, the message on the left is a quantum message. So in particular, this impossibility only holds if F is a, uh, at least a classical functionality. So um, this would not work if F is, uh, if F is quantum. Therefore, to get around the impossibility, um, it is natural to think that uh, F must be inherently quantum. In the case of the protocol that I just described, 
it has to take some quantum inputs. However, um, since our goal is classical position verification, we still have to uh, more or less follow this template. So f has to be a classical function. However, um, one I natural idea is that maybe if f is some function that can only compute it by a quantum computer, then we could maybe still get around this uh, impossibility. And uh, it turns out that um, uh, our idea for finding such an F and this, uh, for proving the security of the position verification is that we are uh, going to make the prover to prepare some computationally unclonable state, similar to the uh, uh, BB84 state or conjugate coding state that was used in the previous protocol. And somehow um, this also enforces the adversary to prepare such a state. Um, okay, so now to describe you how our protocol works, uh, I will need to uh, first tell you how we find such a computational unclonable state. Um, and since I have already alluded previously that um, our, uh, any such protocol needs a proof of quantumness, let me uh, first recall the uh, Braskersky et al. Uh, position, uh, sorry, proof of quantumness protocol. And the main ingredient that they use is what is known as the trapdoor clock free function. So this is a function that maps n bits to n bits uh, indexed by a public key that you can sample. So the claw freeness property says that this function is two to one and it is hard to, furthermore, it is hard to find efficient, uh, sorry, find collisions efficiently, despite there, there being many, many collisions in the function. And the trapdoor property says that you can sample a trapdoor along with the public key, which allows you to efficiently invert any uh, image in the domain so for example, if you get a Y, you can use the trapdoor to recover both free images, X0 and X1. And it turns out that they also need a, an additional property called adaptive hardcore bit, which I would describe under the context of proof of quantumness. So what is the, uh, the primitive called proof of quantumness protocol? Uh, uh, so I will describe this protocol by Brakursky, Chris Kijano, Mahadev, Vazirani and Vidic in 2018. Um, so the premise is that there is a verifier that wants to verify whether he has an efficient quantum device. So the completeness says that if the, the device is quantum, then he will be able to convince the verifier. But if the device has no quantum capabilities, then as long as it is efficient, it will not be able to convince the verifier that uh, in this protocol. And the protocol is the following. So the verifier is going to sample a public key along with the trapdoor and send uh, for the trapdoor clock free function and then send the public key to the uh, prover. The prover is going to prepare an equal superposition of all the X and uh, evaluate the TCF in superposition. And then he measures the out outcome register and uh, tell the verifier what is the measurement outcome. So you can see that um, the post measurement state is simply an equal superposition of X0 and X1, where X0 and X1 are pre-images of Y. So the verifier has having the information of the trapdoor can um, efficiently invert Y to find X0 and X1. And therefore uh, the verifier will be able to know a classical description of this post measurement state. And the rest is simply that the verifier asks the prover to measure this post measurement state either in standard basis or Hadamard basis given by theta. And the prover um, tells the verifier the measurement outcome. And because the verifier has a classical description, he can check that the measurement outcome is consistent uh, with the prover's report, reported outcome. And the adaptive hardcore bit property, you can simply uh, understand it as a computational um, uncertainty principle. So in particular, it means that any efficient prover will not be able to find uh, a triple of y n0 and n1 such that y n0 um, ha make the verifier is make the verifier convinced uh, when theta is zero and y n1 makes the verifier convinced when theta is one simultaneously with probably um, much higher than one half. And it is one half because there is always a trivial uh, strategy that uh, makes the, the, the um, that passes this check with probably one half. Um, so this, uh, and we know how to uh, find this kind of TCF uh, with adaptive hardcore bit property uh, uh, from LWE, although it's a noisy variant. But for this talk, let's just think about uh, the non-noisy variant that I have described here. 
Um, so this uh, gives you a proof of quantumness protocol because um, if you uh, if there is a classical prover that will that will be able to convince you uh, the the that uh, in this protocol, then you can always rewind the classical prover to get both n zero and n one. But furthermore, uh, this adaptive hardcore bit says something more, which is that this post measurement state is actually unclonable. So what you can do actually, uh, so this is simply because if you can approximately clone this state, then you will be able to get both n zero and n one by first measuring the first copy in the standard basis and the other copy in the Hadamard basis. So using so th th there seems to be some computationally unclonable property here. So to uh, so our idea is just to use this kind of thing to construct a proof of quantumness protocol. And the protocol is simply following. So instead of sending the BB84 state in the previous protocol, what we are going to do is actually just uh, send the public key to have the prover prepare the state by himself. And uh, it turns out that in order, order for the security proof to work, we actually need the uh, slightly change the timing constraint. So in particular, we want the verifier on the right to send the measurement outcome a little bit later uh, than uh, the previous protocol. So the prover uh, does the natural thing, which is that he uh, prepares, um, prepares the unclonable state. Uh, and when he receives theta, he is going to measure the, the Post measurement state in the basis specified by theta. And at the end, the verifiers could check that this is consistent using the, uh, the same verifier from the proof of quantumness protocol. And the timing constraint here is uh, crucially, uh, we, we want to check that the, the Y message arrives before uh, the, the NS message arrives. And um, so it turns out this is secure. And a main ingredient of proving the security of this is what is known as a computational non-local gate of try to work on free function. And this might be of independent interest. So basically the, the premise is the same as the proof of quantumness protocol. But uh, after we, we've done the first two rounds, we are actually going to ask the prover to split himself into two halves. Um, and then we, uh, we are going to physically separate these two provers. And the verifier is going to sample uh, one single challenge theta and send it to both of them. And then each of them is supposed to finish the proof of quantumness protocol. Um, and furthermore, uh, this splitting can be arbitrary. So in particular, they could share entanglement. And the claim is that um, no efficient adversary will be able to pass this non-local gain with probably much higher than three quarters. And this is called a non-local gain because if we do allow the provers to, uh, or the two halves of the prover to communicate, then they can always uh, defeat this protocol with priority one. And this is, you can also view this as a uh, computational unclonable property of the, uh, uh, of the, the post measurement state in this case. Um, so this could be of independent interest. So to conclude my talk, I'll point out some future directions uh, for, um, for position verification protocol. So one, uh, I will here, because of time constraint, I will just mention one of them. So uh, our protocol relies on unclonability in order to prove the security. And the consequence of that is that um, actually in our protocol, there is an undesirable property, which is that we, we want the honest prover to have uh, a quantum memory that is coherent for a short period of time. And we would like to ask whether uh, this is inherent. Can we remove this uh, undesirable property? With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Duen. Anybody has questions? Hey. Uh, so why isn't why doesn't the adaptive hardcore bit property show that the success probability of the adversary is half? Like you, you, should, you said that the success probability there should be at most three fourth. Yeah. Can't use it. Can't use the adaptive hard code with probability to show. Yeah. So three quarter is tight because you can always just um, prepare it in super uh, in like and measure in the standard basis. So um, if you get standard basis measurement, both of them can recover correctly. And if you get hardware measurement, then you just guess randomly, which will succeed with probably one half. 
So overall, the success probably is three quarters. Right. Right, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering, I think in one of your slides, you claimed that your work is also fully loss tolerant. Yeah. And I was wondering, you could think because the inputs are classical, that the attackers could always guess that classical information and with some very low probability guess correctly, right. sort of do the scheme. Um, so I was wondering, where do you get the loss tolerance from? Oh, okay. So, so let me um, clarify. So loss tolerance here, like I'm actually considering like maybe a weaker for loss tolerance mm -hmm. than some prior works. In particular, I want the loss to be bounded away from one. So in particular, um, I want the loss to be maybe one minus one over poly, poly lambda. Um, so the loss cannot be okay. exponentially close to one in particular. So loss tolerant then in the sense that for any such loss rate, you can adjust your scheme. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, as so long that, as it is not exponentially or super polynomially close to one. Okay, thank you. Let me maybe ask the final question. Um, you, you were saying that you could also handle a bounded amount of entanglement. Yes. Can you somehow sketch on a high level how, why, why this is the case and how it works? OK. Um, so first of all, um, we, we start with sub exponential um, harness assumption. And mm -hmm. by doing, um, if we do start with sub exponential harness, then what you can do is to use parallel repetition to get your, success, um, your soundness to be sub exponentially small. And once you have that, you can um, basically do a complexity leveraging. So by basically um, uh, the idea of guessing the entanglement or guessing the, so okay. So for example, if you consider the teleportation, you can guess the uh, correction error or like, and with some probability, you actually simulate the adversary in their original thing. And this can be generalized to generic adversary. So this is a, a uh, a technique that has been already used in quantum position verification protocol. And in order to make it work over here, we need to have sub exponential soundness to do the complexity leveraging. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. All right, let's thank uh, Luan for the talk. <laughs>